first thing being that during this talk, we would like to ask for you to please stay seated, try not to move around the room or leave because one, we will not be able to save your seats and you may not be readmitted to the hall. And of course, we want your full attention on what will be happening here on the stage. The other thing being your phones. May I ask right now that everyone puts their phones on silent? Not vibrate, please, but silent. So that again, you don't disturb not just yourself, but your neighbors and everyone can pay attention and learn something today. And this talk will take about an hour, 15 minutes. 15 minutes to the end of the talk, we will have our awesome ushers walk around with little cards and pens so that you can put down whatever questions you may have for the speakers. And then those questions will be read out um, and answered. So that being done, I would now like to introduce some of our speakers for this session. Welcome officially to the second talk of Artex Lagos 2019. Um, one of our speakers who will be coming up today is a co-curator of a Lagos Biennial titled How to Build a Lagoon with Just a Bottle of Wine. And I remember seeing that title and thinking, I die is my stuff, I like it. Um, he was also recently appointed the Associate Curator of Photography at the Art Institute of Chicago. He was the curator curatorial assistant for J.D. Okai, Ojekere's uh, Moments of Beauty. Please welcome to the stage, Antoine Bird. Up next, a gentleman who explores identity in relation to socio-economic and historical geographies. He's interested in using the aesthetic and narrative and material potential of images and objects. He's exhibited widely um, in various circuits, from the Circuit Gallery Toronto to Art 21 Lagos to Leopold Museum in Vienna. Please welcome to the stage, Abraham Ogobase. Hello. Hello. All right, sweet. Cool. So for this conversation, we're just going to keep it organic, and we're going to talk about the Biennale a bit and some of the, its origins and some of the thematic concerns that we wanted to address. And then we're also going to talk about Abraham's work. So Abraham is one of the participating artists in the Biennale. So we're going to kind of trade off and uh, yeah, just have a, an organic, loose conversation. Yeah. Do you want to start, or should I? You can start. Okay. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, Antoine, um, in 2016, you co curated um, the exhibition at the Chiasma Museum of Contemporary Art with um, the late. Or Silva. 2011. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At the Chiasma yeah. show. Um, and also, you've um, worked with other. You've worked on other projects as well. Outside of um, that, you worked with BC again on the Bamako photo encounters in 2016, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Um, what What informed, you know, or what? Why? Why now? I mean, why, why Lagos? Why is Lagos your next project? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was, I was at a dinner a few nights ago and I was talking with someone about um, how proud I feel to say that um, the story of my own interest in curatorial work began in Lagos uh, exactly 10 years ago. Um, I, when I finished my undergraduate degree, in art history, I was interested in studying contemporary African art. And at the time, there were no courses available at my university. And so I came to Lagos, and it was through BC who welcomed me here to um, study as a Fulbright scholar. And after those two and a half years of being a Fulbright scholar and also a curatorial assistant, I was fairly convinced that I wanted to be a curator. And then, after that, I worked on several other projects with her, and then 
I started the PhD program at Northwestern, and while I was at Northwestern, I was also able to work on the Bamako Photo Biennale. And so that was the first instance where I was living in the US, but then also working professionally in, on the continent. Um, and so now, being in Chicago at this museum, uh, which is an encyclopedic large-scale museum, I don't have the same uh, sort of flexibility to travel a lot uh, and to do long-term projects. And so when the invitation to work on the Biennale came from Folo Kunle Oshun, the director, I knew that it was something that I wanted to do, in part because it would, would have been a full circle moment, or it is a full circle moment of being here 10 years ago and coming back and being able to contribute to the Biennale. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, um, explain the title, How to Build a, a Lagoon with Just a Bottle of Wine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the title has been, it's been slightly controversial. Um, and I, I don't think that we, myself, and Oyunda Fakeye and Tosin Oshinoa, the three curators of the Biennale, I don't think we anticipated that it would have such uh, the response that it's had. We were thinking, we knew at the outset that we wanted to focus on urbanism and the built environment, and we wanted a title that could provoke artists, to prompt them to think about the work in different ways. And there was a book that was published in 2010 by Odia Ofemun, who's a Nigerian sort of uh, editor and cultural commentator, and the book is called uh, Lagos of the Poets, and it was published by Hornbill Press, and it's one of my favorite books on a city. Uh, in part because it, it's a compilation of 75 poems written in homage or in response to the ethos of Lagos. And the first poem in this book is by the Nigerian writer Akim Lasisi. And on the fourth line of the poem, uh, the reason why it's the first poem in the book is because the poem tells an origin story of Lagos. And on the fourth line he says, uh, when the lagoon was just a bottle of wine. And when I read that, I, I was struck by how something so omnipresent, something so large scale, something so integral to the identity of Lagos can be reduced and diminished and miniaturized as a bottle of wine. Uh, it seemed at the time also to connote ideas of exchange and how Lagos in the 14th century was founded you know, as a almost a commercial trading spot, a uh, center uh, across West Africa. So, my uh, co-curators and I we were really interested in, in this idea of trade and the Atlantic slave trade. But one of the things, one of the slight criticisms that we've got for selecting this title is that for many people it conjures up ideas of uh, European culture. Uh, the, some have said that it, it's, it's not African enough um, and that it, it's slightly elitist in some ways, this I idea of wine. Um, and, I, and I find that interesting because there's nowhere in the title a qualifier to wine. It doesn't say European wine, it doesn't say grape wine. So it just as well relates to the history of palm wine. And palm wine is something that's not European in any form because it, it only grows in Micronesia, in Asia, Africa, and South America. It's a product of the global south. And so we were also interested in, 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 in the idea of palm wine and its history um, in literature with Amos Tutuola's The Palm Wine Drinker from 1952 or the recurrence of palm wine and Chinua Achibe's writings, uh, especially in Things Fall Apart. So we wanted the title and we wanted to phrase it as a question so that it could prompt artists to think imaginatively about urbanism, uh, to think imaginatively about the title in ways that weren't prescriptive but open. Thank you. And also what, what informed the curatorial framework for the selection of the artist as well? The what? What informed the curatorial framework for the selection of the artist? So we had a, it was a staggered, a sort of tiered approach to selecting the artists. Uh, on the one hand, we knew at the outset that we didn't have a lot of financial resources, so we didn't have the ability to travel around the continent and do studio visits. Um, and so we adopted an approach that we also used when I was working on the Bamako Biennale. Um, and that approach was essentially to do an open call, to invite artists to make proposals for projects that they'd like to realize in Lagos. Uh, while at the same time also having the flexibility to reach out to artists individually and to make invitations to them to come and do work, um, whether it's something that the Biennale would support through a commission or by allowing artists to come for residencies to produce work in the city. Um, 
And so that's ultimately what happened. Uh, it's a combination of artists who applied through Open Call and artists that we selected. And for me, uh, you know, I, I, I'm somewhat, I guess I would say, unapologetically sentimental um, in some of the choices that I made for artists that I wanted to work with. Um, because there are five artists in the BNL, uh, you, you um, Ndidi DK, Timin Tayo Ogumbi, Sabelo Lamgini, and Uthman Wahab, uh, all of whom I knew when I was just, you know, the small kid trying to figure out um, what being a curator meant. And in some ways, my own trajectory has developed in response to their own trajectories and emergence as artists. And so, you know, th having this be, you know, uh, a moment to actually work with many of those artists whose insight and whose generosity helped shape my formative experiences of Lego meant a lot. Um, and then there are other artists, you know, working in different parts of the world. Dina Khoury, for example, who um, is a Jordanian-American artist based in Berlin. Um, I admired her work for a long time, and she was interested in coming to Lagos, and so, yeah. yeah. Um, what about the challenges? Uh, of the selection or the... No, the I mean, of just organizing the biennial itself, like... I'm really interested to know if you had any challenges like infrastructural challenges or there were there were so many challenges um, and we're still working with a lot of these challenges um, uh, it's hard to, to pinpoint one I, I would say that um, uh, from a curatorial perspective one of the challenges was you know working remotely um, I made three trips to Lagos I think before the opening um, and my colleagues, Oyenda and Tosin, they're all based here. And so they have a different degree of access than I had having to, you know, call in for Skype meetings, et cetera. So that was challenging. Um, of course, it's always a challenge with budgets. Um, the BNL, we did some fundraising and we had some success. Um, but, you know, it had a big impact on the projects that we selected. So we were very decisive early on that, you know, a large number of the projects should be produced in Lagos. They should be responsive to the ethos of the city. They should draw on materials that are locally available so that we can bypass the need to insure artworks or to ship artworks. Um, and, and I think we were fairly successful in that regard. Um, a lot of artists who you know, don't live here came to Lagos to make work. In other cases, artists who were based here you know, produce work. Um, so the budget challenge, uh, I, I felt like it wasn't that much of an impediment in terms of the production of work, but the space itself, that was probably one of the greatest challenges. Um, we first went to the site in October of last year, but before deciding whether or not to ultimately select Independence House as the key venue for the Biennale. And then from there, we had uh, several hurdles in terms of how much we wanted to renovate the space. Um, I think there's some, supposed to be some images. Uh, maybe okay. there's another one that we're yeah, showing on the inside. And, and just, just, just to kind of yeah. interject now, the final question will be why Independence House? Ah, okay, okay. So <clears throat> the first edition of the BNL that took place in 2017, it was sited at the railway compound in Yaba. And uh, it focused, as does our edition, on questions of urbanism and the built environment. And that was one of the points of attraction for me in, in, in wanting to work on the Biennale was because it had this, this focus on, on the built environment that was elaborated through the site itself and its history. And so for the second edition, we collectively agreed that we should continue that focus with the hopes that in 10 or 20 years, the Lagos Biennale can be a major platform for thinking about urbanism and contemporary art together. And so just as the Bamako Biennale has this focus on photography and lens-based media, we're hoping that the Lagos Biennale can take urbanism and the built environment to have it be part of its identity. And so working, uh, so our choice to work in independence building was partly motivated by its history. So it's a 25-story concrete reinforced building situated on Lagos Island. And it was built in 1959. It was gifted by the British government to Nigeria. And it was finished in 1963. And at the time, it was one of the tallest buildings in all of Nigeria. And so that height itself signified the country's modern sovereign ambitions just after independence. And so we were interested in, in that idea, um, that, that sense of history, but also 
on the ground floor of the building, there's uh, an incredible mosaic by Yusuf Grillo that was a part of the, the original site. It was, it was finished in 1963, and it was the first mosaic that Yusuf Grillo has ever made. Uh, he was in his late 20s at the time. And then on the sides of the buildings, there are these two magisterial bas-relief sculptures by the Benin sculptor Felix Idubor that were also produced in 1963, and they were part of the original site. And so we were very much interested in how public displays of art played a major role in the building's sort of construction and its identity. And we think of the Biennale in some ways as elaborating that, that history, of elaborating the intersection between art and architecture. And so it was an ideal venue for that reason, but also because you know, it, it's so commonplace in contemporary art discourse to hear discussions about how art needs to be responsive to the city or how it needs to be in dialogue with you know, local realities or you know, things of that nature. And we were very much interested in the idea that not only the artworks themselves could offer propositions for thinking about urbanism, but also the forms of display would reinforce that because you know, Tosin Oshinoa, the, the, one of the co-curators and a brilliant architect, she was adamant early on about not wanting to build walls in the space. So all of the art is on, you know, basically cited on the original blueprint of the building, which means that your experience of art is placed in direct proximity to the city itself. Um, and that's something that this, this particular site um, really affords us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now we, we can <laughs> change gears. All right, so for you, uh, so you're one of the artists um, in the Biennale. You have a major, I think, brilliant project. Uh, could you begin by uh, explaining why you accepted our invitation to show in the Biennale and what it, what it meant to you of all the other projects that you could be working on now? Um, for me, it was a no-brainer, I mean, just on so many levels. Um, I've known you for a very long time. I think since 2009. Um, and we have a very strong working relationship. Um, and I think that that kind of like shapes or informs the way I will make my decision because I've, I've known you and um, you've seen me grow. I've seen you grow and it was very easy for me to kind of like just, you know, decided that I want to be a part of it. But also the fact that I moved to Toronto, I moved to Canada, yeah. also for me it was a very, I'm very sentimental about Lagos and, this, and the city itself. Mm. And I've always wanted to be rooted, to be grounded, you know. I feel like it's important even though you are, you are an artist in the diaspora, I feel like it's important to constantly be rooted, you know, even if it's not physical, ideologically or spiritually like to be rooted in something that you can connect to yeah. which is home um, home can be connected to spaces but also can be connected to you know um, the idea of memory yeah. can, can, can you talk about the the specific project that you decided to to show yeah um, I mean the moment you send the proposal to me and you send the invitation I started thinking about independence building and um, and what the space actually meant. Um, for me, it was, um, you know, it was a, a no-brainer, you know, to actually think about, you know, um, what I would present because I've had a working, I've, my, my trajectory basically I've been exploring the issue of identity but also with connection to colonialism and post-colonial issues, mm -hmm. but not in a direct way, mm -hmm. but in the way that is very much connected to memory or my personal experience, I'm the one that I have to deal with the fact that even I have to deal with applying for visas and having to be tensed about waiting for, the, for, for my visa because I have to travel to another country. And I'm wondering like, oh, but I'm a permanent resident. Why can't this be this? Why can't it just be easy? Do, do I have to be a, a citizen first for me to just travel? Do I have to, do I need a the passport to actually have this act. And that takes us back to, you know, 1885, you know, the Berlin Conference and how the world has been framed and how Africa is a very much a Western ideology, is a Western concept. And how that has informed the way that we navigate today. 
and these things for me are the things that have kind of like informed this body of work. This work explores relationship, a textual relationship between you know um, text and images actually. And the book was written by Lord Lugard, Frank Lord Lugard, um, who was a British colonial governor yeah. at the time, and it was transferred from Cape Town yeah. to Nigeria. It was very firm. Um, and he wrote this book called The Dwar Mandate in British Tropical Africa in 1822. And the book, the use of language, I find it very fascinating. People might look at the book or read the book and say, okay, this book is, this book is um, derogatory. But I don't, I don't look at it that way. I'm, I'm thinking about how to, to navigate the book in the way that it's also a reflection of the time that we're living in now as well and how much hasn't changed as well. And also to, to, to kind of also constantly question the perception of, you know, of being a black person navigating the world, you know, even though you're an artist in the diaspora or you're black American or you're black French, you know, the, the constant challenge of just having to constantly prove that I'm a good person yeah. is exasperating, you know, um, even if I have a blue passport or, or whatever, it's just, exasperating that I have to constantly prove that I'm a good person with integrity yeah. and some other race don't have to deal with that complexity mm -hmm. so I took an interest in exploring this issue of colonialism but to explore them in a way that is very like that is in chapters so so I started this body of work where I started layering and started looking at photography as a very as a medium that is very limiting, it's a very it's a two-dimensional medium, yes. but it's also very complex. Photography in itself has a very has a, its own constraint since inception because it's two-dimensional, yeah. and I and I feel like it's not enough. You know, I know there's a place for photography, like a two-dimensional photography, yeah. like David Goldblatt, for example. I like his work, and there are other people like Wolfgang Tillmans that I like his work. But also, how do you begin to think about the relationship between photography and how you can actually stretch? the possibility of what photography can be. And I started thinking about printing yeah. and how printing is it's so, like, it's very much overlooked, yeah. but also printing has kind of like afforded me the ability to play yeah. where I can look at lithography, where I can break things down into CMYK mode, yeah. say cyan, magenta, and say I take one photograph and the photograph of, say, me, but I can print them in a monochrome and say, cyan, magenta, and then it begins to question what you're saying. You're seeing the same image of me, but you're seeing them in different color. And the frequency changes completely because of the color. Yeah. But then it also talks about technology as well, how you connect, how you merge the four color separation together to form one image. Yeah. But if I decide, but then I'll decide to say, okay, no, I don't want to merge it, I want to break it. Sure, sure, sure. And just, you know, talk about one particular image. Because I, I also feel like, Photographs are a lot. There, there are a lot of photographs in the world. There are too many photographs, too many pictures. And I feel like when you begin to think about photography and what you can say with photography, yeah. there's just so much when you start thinking about printing and printing methods and materiality and how you can actually stretch that. Yeah, I want to ask you, I mean, one of the interesting things about this, this particular image of the installation is that it seems to emphasize how the, the image is laid flat. That, it's, yeah. that our bodily encounter with it, it's not one that's it's on the wall, frontal. but it, it's laid flat in the same way that we're used to resting books exactly. in our laps and looking down onto them. And uh, I also wanted to ask you about the tables and how you think of the tables in relation to the images. Are they a part of the work for you yeah. or are they just supports for the images? No, I, I uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, the totality of my work is inspired by so many things. I mean, it's inspired by architecture, it's inspired by design, it's inspired by anthropology, by science, by spirituality. And how do you create forms for these things? It's, it's complex. How do you create forms for, for these things? It's very difficult to create forms for these things. And I'm constantly thinking, okay, to, to break, to be able to break and say, to look for languages, you know, particular language that can um, express that which I feel yeah. is very complex and photography is not enough and that's why I said that the two-dimensionality of photography 
it's very challenging, but when I started looking at how I can begin to approach the challenge, it made photography much more interesting for me, and it gave photography more meaning and life for me, whereby I can, photography becomes a starting point, but it's not even, it's not even the end, you know, it just becomes a starting point, become part of a, a larger idea. And, you know, like to think about the tables also, um, it's not just for aesthetic, but also it's just, it's a combination of the ideas in, in itself, you know. Um, it's almost like you're in a classroom, or almost like if you, another thing is about, I was also interested in the posture of the people when they engage the work, because it's almost like they're bowing, you know, like when you go see the work, it's almost like you're taking a bow. Um, and that, that for me is quite, it's quite interesting to just kind of like see how people can become submissive, you know, when they want to engage the work, yeah. you know. And do you think that, um, I mean, this, this approach to display is something that was born out of your 2016 show at CCA? Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, can you talk yeah. about that? Um, I was a part of a, a program by CCA, um, um, supported by CCA, and it was done in Salzburg. It was part of a Salzburg Summer Academy program. Mm -hmm. And um, BC, uh, uh, the late Olaf BC Silva called me and said, um, Abraham, would you be interested in going to Salzburg? You know, so you can go see what you can, you know, come up with, you know, and see how you can improve and develop yourself, you know, in this area, because I like your work, I like the way you're going about these ideas, but I feel like this, this particular program would be interesting for you. So I went for a program that was facilitated by Jay Salom, who happens to live in Montreal. Um, and I went, I went there, I, I took some photographs, but then the classes that I went to, it's so funny because the class that I went to was, was on printing and all of that, but I wasn't, I wasn't really interested in my class. Yeah. You know, I was actually interested in other classes, like the people who were doing comics or who were doing sculpture, who were doing other types of things. Because I, I constantly feel like these are the things that inform my work. It's not the photography. I know how to take photograph. It's not, I'm not interested in being the best photographer. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in transmitting frequencies and emotion. And to do them in the most simple way, in the most minimal way, and the most honest way. Um, and some people can find ways that they can say, oh, okay, I think this guy is poetic. But I think, I don't like to say my work is poetic. I prefer for people to say what the work is to them. Um, but I want to believe that I'm inspired by different things. Like, I love ambient music. The idea that ambient music, like Brand Eno, music for the airport is one of my best, you know, I mean, I've told you. But the fact that ambient music, like, it can float, there are no lyrics, it's just sound, but it makes you float in a way. And I started thinking about photography in that sense, whereby I can create images using different printing techniques to create these layered experiences, and then this abstraction also that can just create these floating spaces as well. You know, and for me, it's really, it's really interesting to begin to think about how something so simple as a cloud become a part of something and then you begin to create different types of experiences just from one image and then you add some type of digital negative yeah. on top of it and then you print on top of an image and then you print on top of the same image and then you print on top of the same image. And you know, whereby you become almost like a composer yeah. in a way, like an orchestra, like you, know, like you become like a composer. And I, I feel like the ability to play is what drives me to be able to play, to be able to conduct, yeah. is what drives me. To take photograph is not as interesting for me than going to the flea market, yeah. you know. I, I'm also very much interested in archives, yeah. but archives in, not, in, in, in a non-conventional way, you know, like it's very easy for me to think about archives and think about institutions, but how do I think about archive in a non-conventional way, whereby I go to the flea market to get, to, 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 to make findings. 
and to discover or to be aware that I'm at a friend's place or a friend's mother's house that has a huge library and I can just feel like I can actually find something in a book or a file or something. And I'm not interested in photographic archive. I'm interested in um, documents. I'm interested in everything. I'm interested in astrology, on science, on, you know, how, that, how our bowels work, you know, just the whole human experience. I'm just interested in so many things because I feel like you can't really box, you know. Um, I, I, I want to ask though, because for as long as I've known you, you've been very curious yeah. about the world and about, you know, different things, yeah. but you've always tried to filter that curiosity yeah. through photo photography. Yeah. Um, you've always tried to stretch what a photograph can be or what, uh, what it can look like or, or how it can be displayed. Mm. And so your interest in music, for example, I mean, the way that you use the language of, of, of conducting uh, a sort of visual experience, mm. um, and then also your interest in, in documents and, and, and not simply photographic archives, yeah, exactly. but archives broadly. But what is it that, that uh, has kept you coming back to photography rather than shifting and going and say working in sculpture or in a symphony or, yeah. or you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the more I say I don't like photography, the more, the more it just calls me back. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so weird because I remember not taking photographs for one year and, and that was because I, I was struggling. I think that was actually the time where BC called me and said, Abraham, I think you need a break to go clear your head. And this is something I'm going to say here, like, you know, it's, it's um, very few people can actually um, see someone and actually not just be a, a mentor, but to be able to also guide you in a, in a certain way. And Bissy was very good with that, you know, like she could see something in somebody and nurture it, you know, and I think that was just that because the birth of what you see today of my work is honestly like it's really my experience, my very difficult experience with BC. Yeah. Because BC can be very hard. Like, you can just tell me, like, Abraham, just shut up. Yeah. I, I bought this book for you. Like, you need to come and pick it. Like, you know, like, so there's constant, you know, like, back and forth and um, conversations. And, but just to be interested in somebody. And I feel like, you know, my growth is not all to me alone. Um, but the fact that, you know, one can actually like, because it's easy for one to see my work here or see my work in certain collection and just feel like I just grew from, a, from the soil. Like, it's, 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 it's a combination of so many things. Like, you know, people have been part of my life that have shaped the way that I think, that have shaped the way that I work today. And BC was one of them. You were one of them as well, you know. I might, I might be slightly older than you, but, you know, you've also been a mentor in a way, you've also guided me in a way. I think it's a two-way street. Yeah, 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 in the same yeah, way. In a way, you know, so, so for me, I, 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 I feel like, you know, photography, so back to the question, I just feel like, you know, photography is, it's a beautiful medium. I mean, there, there are people that also give me hope when I look at photography. People like Wolfgang Tillman, for example. I like the way it work with photography and how it stretches the meaning of photography. Or somebody like Hiroshi Shigemoto, the way he thinks about you know, photography. But that's because of my interest in the idea of stretching the medium. And I say it, you know, without apologies, like people might say, oh, why am I mentioning this name? Like, am I just name dropping? I like certain work, like African photographers, like the work that I did in Joss that's, um, I showed last year called The Layers of Time um, at R21 um, was basically inspired also by um, David Goldblatt, you know, and I read one of his books called On the Minds, and it was a very fascinating book. He's such a brilliant photographer. And that again, actually, like, again, made me question photography again because the photographs, they are two dimensional, but they were so beautiful and so simply taken, but they were extremely beautiful and very delicate in the way that he takes the photograph, but also in the way that it frames, you know, um, his ideas. 
but also the fact that it was interested in a subject that I was interested in, because that's actually what informs the way I navigate you know, my subject, because I was like, okay, which, who's my reference point? And I started thinking about, okay, who's done this? Okay, I said, okay, David Goldblatt, you know, is somebody that I would like to like, see his work. But another, another photographer also that I like, but he didn't do something on mine, is um, Roy Dara Cover. And, the, and the, the book, you know, the, the, the jazz book that he made, um, um, it's, uh, what's the title of that book again? I can't remember. Uh, yeah? Which, yes. Ah, okay, okay. I can't remember the title. Yes, I, I, I can't remember the title of the book, but the when I think about the way Roy Dara cover photographs and photograph, you know, the Black American experience and the jazz experience, it's very similar to how I also want to work with, we you know, with with photographs as well. Um, how it's very fluid, you know, in the way that it navigates the space. And I, I wanted to ask also. Um, I mean, the CCA exhibition in 2016 and then the Art 21 show last year, yeah. just, as, just as you were leaving yeah. for Toronto. Um, and then this year you're showing in the Biennale and also uh, in the show that opens at CCA tomorrow. And so I wanted to ask uh, how important it is for you or what motivates your desire to consistently, and con to consistently continue to exhibit in Lagos despite now being you know, in Toronto. Um, it's, I think it's just to be grounded, to be rooted in, yeah. in something, to have a base. And that was what I was explaining earlier, where it's, 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 it's nice for me that like I'm outside of a country whereby I, can, I have resources and material to work with, to play with. But I'm very much a part of this Nigerian experience. I, I mean, I, I was 39 when I, I mean, so it's not like I've lived abroad all my life. I mean, I was 39 when I left Nigeria, I mean, just last year. And, and so I've just barely been a year, just a year plus, just living outside of the country full time. And, and for me, I don't, think, I don't think I want to start a new life now. I mean, I'm already 40 and I'm like, you know, it's not, I'm not starting a new life, but it's to be able to continue on the trajectory of my practice. And that's why I said, even the works that I've made for the Lagos Biennial, for me also, is a chapter of what I did last year for R21, you know, which explored landscapes and colonial history and the idea of mining and tailings um, and how mining also, or colonial history can also leave some type of residue on the landscape and how that also um, becomes, you know, part of the landscape, but also how do I become also part of it because I became part of the the landscape, just kind of like navigating the, nans, the, the landscape, on, but also it's almost like you become like, almost like an anthropologist in a way whereby you, you're searching, you're looking for something, but you're not looking for something that is tangible. So even the images that I'm interested in on the landscape, they're not, they're not physical structures that are destroyed or things like, they're very, they can be abstract images of like, you know, of certain type of landscape, you know, that might be nothing, but I would give certain meaning to them because of my connection to that particular, of my connection to that particular um, time. You know, because my work has always been about time also. It's always been about time. It could be in the context of history. It could be in the context of, you know, um, the idea of memory. And this for me, I wanted to kind of like, also like, you know, like, so now that I've, I did that work, the works that I've, that I've done here now, I'm not interested in like making work and say, okay, this is a finished work. I also feel like it's important for artists to understand that your work is a continuation. So when you have an, an exhibition or a binale, it's okay to create something that you've started working on. People might not really understand the totality of your work because they haven't seen your entire body of work. Yeah. And it's very okay because you are part of an exhibition that has about 40 people. It's very complex. People are hustling for the space and mental space, you know, and a lot of egos are flying here and there, you know, and it's very easy to deal with art. It's very difficult to deal with, you know, with, with artists in that regard. But, thinking, but yeah. oh, I was going to say, thinking about time, uh, yeah. where, uh, what's next? Like after the, um, the series in, in the Biennale now and also the CCA show, like, do you have other plans to continue working in this way? 
or for your next um, exhibition in Bamako? Um, yeah, thank you, actually. Yeah. I mean, for this show that I'm doing for, for, for the CCA tomorrow, um, actually, it's funny, it's called the Diaspora at Home. But also the form that I've taken as well is very different because I'm taking a f the form of, um, in fact, the work that I did, um, the commission, is basically explores the idea of the diaspora. But what I did was that I used Hugh Masakela as an embodiment of the diaspora. And how, for me, is a symbol of like, you know, a nomad in exile. And how, in his lyrics, um, it constantly talks about movement, but also is a, it's a product of apartheid, you know, but also his, his, his father also was part of the, you know, of the revolutionary group as well, but and also, so he's, he's lived constantly, you know, moving from place to place, like, and you can, you can see that through, through his music. Uh, I'm very much embedded in music a lot, because I feel like there's a lot of things that's hidden in music, uh, and specific type of music, like Hugh Masekela's is definitely one of my inspiration and one of my heroes for sure, because it's such a, not just, we can reduce Hugh Masekela to, Hugh Masekela's music to playing trumpet, but I think it's much more than a trumpeter. It's a poet, you know, and it's a, and it's a brilliant poet at that, you know, and the way he uses words and, you know, the way uses his word to navigate space and time. It's extremely brilliant for me. And I used, I used his work, I used his lyrics um, of the places that is being and his aspiration and dream for Africa, because he has a very strong Pan-Africanist view and opinion, very strong opinions. And he talks about the Zambezi River, the River Congo. Of course, his work is very much rooted in colonialism as well. But I like it because it's very poetic, because it doesn't have to be literal. It's not literal. So my work is almost like um, an interpretation of us, his lyrics and the places that's his journey to. So I created a lyrical map of Hugh Masekela's experience um, and layered it with mine as well. And um, yeah, and which I, I hope people will see tomorrow. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, which is very so. much, much more different from, from even this. So I'm constantly, but, it's, it also has that element of layering, yeah. but there's also a level of installation as well. Yeah. You know, so installation, again, is very much part of my work yeah. now because I feel like photography, as I've said earlier, is very two-dimensional for me. And I, and, I, and I say that with no disrespect to people who do photography as a two-dimensional practice because I feel like there's a place for it. Like, who would agree with me that Hiroshi Shigemoto is a, is a grandmaster? Or who would agree with me that, you know, Paul Jaker is a grandmaster? Yeah. Or who would agree with me that, you know, somebody like Sami Baloji is, you know, it's, 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 it's just brilliant, yeah. you know what I mean? And even Sami, for example, also is, is shifted as well. Yeah. You know, it's you know, shifted. So the fact that we're, we, we want to be reduced as a photographer, I mean, I find it a bit problematic because I think my ideas are too, are too complicated to be reduced to a two-dimensional art. I can also give it uh, a sense of um, reach, of more reach, reach and by creating other types of forms. And those forms are kind of like informed by the ideas because that's actually what informs my aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. Because my aesthetic is not I'm not just interested in the idea of aesthetic, but my aesthetic is informed by so many things. It's, it's informed by experiences, it's informed by the books that I'm reading at a particular time, it's informed by, and that's what I, I said earlier, like, how do you create a form for these things? It's complex. You can't take a photograph and say, that's enough, but to be able to now begin to use the idea of layering and start looking at material yes. also gives me that, that freedom. Agility. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like even like this, like for this image, for example, you can see the negative on top of a lithographic print. Yeah. Um, and then I'm beginning to also look at fabric yeah. and the idea of cutting, mm -hmm. um, which is what I've printed on in recent time to look at cutting sheets, yeah. but also look at chiffon as a transparent material that you can also place on it, but also cutting in itself as a material that has a History, history yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. you know, and it's really, 
it's just fascinating where I want to go with my work where I don't feel I have to talk so much about the work to validate the work, but the materiality itself lends you know, itself to you know, what, what it means and what it represents. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a really, really great, I think, way to end. Um, I think we have now time for some questions. Yeah? Uh, or is it Timmy Tayo? Or, okay, so maybe she's going to read it. I think she's going to read the questions. Ah, okay, I see. Um, so, Tayo, one of the quad, one of the questions is specific to the uh, the images. Could we go back to? Um, uh, uh, all right, uh, let's go to the 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 Sabello's work. All right. Uh, so the question is: Of the artist's work included in your presentation, could you speak uh, to how one of these projects relates to the ideas the artist originally proposed? Um, so this is a, it's a, um, a photographic series by a South African artist named Sabelo Namgini, and it's called The Royal House of Allure. And the, um, the, there, there are multiple dimensions to, to the work that I, I want to speak about. On the one hand, um, Sabelo came to Lagos in 2009, and he produced a, a body of photographs that analyzed uh, power lines throughout the city and how the power lines sort of have their own sort of aesthetic, these sort of spaghetti lines. But the project never went anywhere, and he continued to work on other things, and he, he never returned back to the city. And so for the Biennale, when we were thinking about the artists who we wanted to invite to Lagos, uh, Sabello was one of them in part because he already had an introduction to the city. And so with this body of work, he came, uh, I think it switched. Uh, uh, so with this body of work, he came uh, to Lagos and he began to engage an LGBTQIA community, uh, producing a photo essay called The House of Allure. And essentially, um, he's documenting his everyday interactions with the subjects, but also what's fascinating about the series is that there's an ambiguity in a lot of the images. In some images, you can't tell whether or not Sibella was motivated to take the image because of something that he saw, or if it was because the subjects wanted to take advantage of Sibella's presence uh, to have themselves photographed. And so we very much like that, that sense of reciprocity, but it also, it's interesting because some of you may be thinking, what does this have to do with urbanism or the built environment, et cetera? Um, but the photographs were taken in a physical space that's a safe space that's welcoming to people despite their various degrees of difference. And so that's why it was important for us to, to have the, the work in the show. But then there's another aspect that Sibello was supposed to come to Lagos to present the work but he wasn't able to come because of the, he was denied a visa, which in some ways can be, I think, linked to the political tensions between South Africa and Nigeria that are going on today. And so as a consequence, he wasn't able to come, but he, he shipped the work to us, and they arrived the day before the opening, and we were able to, to install it. So, yeah. Um, another question is, uh, There seems to be a lot of excitement about the site-specific nature of the BNL. Does the BNL intend to continue with this strategy going forward? Um, it's my sincere hope that the BNL continues with this strategy. I mean, we've been asked, I think, on numerous occasions, my colleagues and I, whether or not the next edition of the BNL will happen at Independence House. Um, and I personally hope that it doesn't. Uh, because in the same way that the first edition of the Biennale brought a lot of attention to the railway compound on the mainland, in the same way that the second edition has brought attention to Independence House. I mean, one of the great things about the Independence House is that a lot of artists who are based in Lagos have come and said that they want to have exhibitions there. And so in some ways, it's a new venue for other people to carry forward and, and repurpose and, and give a, a new life to. 
And so I hope that in the future the Biennale could stand for that, that it can select another historically important piece of architecture in the city, uh, go through the process of, of renovating or engaging it by other means, and have it be a venue for the display and engagement of contemporary art. So, yeah, that's my hope. But that's Fola Kunle Oshun, our, our great director, who will have to, to make that ultimate call. Then uh, another question. Uh, could you speak to the balance between local and international artists exhibiting in the Biennale? Um, I would say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think on the one hand, uh, my colleagues and I, we were very adamant and we were very conscious of how historically Lagos has inspired so many discussions and exhibitions and research projects related to urbanism. That it, it's almost been this sort of fetishistic interest in what it is that makes Lagos work. Um, on the part of you know, anthropologists, on the part of urban planners, on the part of architects, etc. But a lot of those discussions tend to happen outside of Lagos. Uh, major exhibitions on urbanism in cities have included artists by uh, artists that are active in Lagos, and I'm thinking of some that have happened in Europe and some that have happened in the U.S. over the past uh, decade or so. And then a lot of also publications on Lagosian urbanism. And so Oyinda and Tosin and myself, when we were thinking about a lot of these things, it was important for us to have artists who are based in Lagos but also artists who are based outside of Lagos, and to think of the city as a meeting point, as a convening point for these discussions of, of urbanism. So not just have Lagos be a case study for audiences outside the city, but to have artists be responsive to their own sort of approaches to the city and have that debate or dialogue happen for Lagosian audiences. And so we, I think we, we met that balance. There's an, almost an equal split of artists who are act, either active in the city or who um, have spent significant, significant amount of time here. And then there are other artists who are addressing urbanism from their own perspectives, be it Mexico City or um, Tokyo or, I don't know, Oyinda, I'm looking at you, um, uh, Paris. Um, so yeah, it's a myriad of, of, of localities. And then another question. Um, um, so. The, someone's asking to repeat the name of the book um, that I mentioned earlier. The book is called Lagos of the Poets, and it was published in 2010 by Odia Ofemun, and it's published in Lagos by Hornbill Press. And that's where Akim Lassisi's poem first appeared for me, and that's where the title of the Biennale derives. And I think this will be the last question. Um, uh, let's see. I don't quite under, understand that question. Um, it says art scenes, curatorial practices have been developed predominantly in the West, but now contemporary African art scenes are getting more recognition worldwide. Is there anything particular to rather Afrocentric? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's great that um, um, Contemporary art scenes on the continent are getting more recognition worldwide. I think there, there's a, a greater degree of engagement um, on the part of curators and also on the part of artists. Um, I think audiences in African cities for art are expanding in ways that um, some might say unprecedented. I, I don't know if I'm really qualified to say that, but it feels that way. Um, and in Lagos especially over the past, I would say six weeks, I mean, there's so much happening. Art Summit, the Biennale, um, Lagos Photo, Art X Lagos, so many important exhibitions have opened, so many you know, other events are happening, and 10 years ago it wasn't this way at all. And so I, I, I can only agree with, with the statement because I, yeah, I can't quite figure out the, the last bit, but um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen,
Can I ask that we please clear the room so that we can prepare for the next talk as we are done with this one. Thank you very much for joining us. We will see you very shortly. But can we please clear the room? Thank you.